Hi, this is Jeff Collins from the Australia Ensemble. I'm thrilled to introduce to you uh, one of Australia's most distinguished composers, Ross Edwards. Ross joined us recently from his house in uh, Sydney to discuss his work Incantations for Wind Quintet. I hope you enjoy hearing from the composer and on behalf of all of the members of the ensemble, thank you for connecting with us online. We look forward to being back at UNSW as soon as we can. Okay, so, so Ross Edwards, thank you for Zooming with me this morning. And it's a great chance to talk with you about your wonderful Wind Quintet incantations. Um, I'm sorry that the Australian Ensemble audiences will be missing out on a live performance this year. Um, I'm wondering maybe if we should uh, retitle it to incarcerations rather than incantations. Uh, <laughs> yes, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but here's hoping we'll be able to put it in a, a program sometime in the future for the audience to hear it live. Um, the good news is, though, that the piece is on a lovely ABC Classics recording uh, called Incantations, and it's a collection of your chamber music. And that, also, that recording also features the, um, the commission from the Australian Ensemble, Animisms. Um, so uh, it's yeah, well it's worth first, the first piece, isn't it? The first piece on the CD. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's it's well worth our, our audience if you if you're tuning into this little uh, little vlog spot, then to um, go and check out the recording on Spotify. Or in fact, you can even still buy a physical CD, which I think is amazing. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, Ross, my first question goes to the style of music that we hear in, in incantations. And there are a few descriptors of this style. You've, uh, we can say that it's a dance-like nature, lots of little repeated cells, and uh, there's frequently some up-tempo moments, um, very quick and bright music, vibrant character on the whole, but there are also some more melancholy and reflective moments. Um, so this style of your music first emerged in the early 1980s with your piano concerto and the now very famous piece, Marimba Dances. Um, this music caused some shock among critics and other composers at the time, particularly those who were committed to a sort of European avant-garde way of thinking. Um, I'll note though that audiences were much more welcoming of, the, of, of this music at the time. Um, could you give us some insights on how you found yourself writing music like we hear in incantations in this way. And what were the paths that led you there? Yeah, well, we should first say that you're probably the world expert on my music, know, know more, more about it than I do, having written your master's thesis on it. So a, it's very, a disclaimer in there, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's very appropriate that you're um, asking these very, these excellent questions. Um, I think with the Wind Quintet Incantations was written in 1985, I think, am I right? <laughs> Something like that. And uh, it was a, a commission from the from Music of Viva. And uh, I was a bit dismayed when they asked me to write a Wind Quintet, to be honest, because they, they are difficult. Anyway, I got right into it and I thought, well, I'll experiment with a few uh, Sort of different things because before that I'd been writing very uh, sort of uh, skeletal works which came out of the environment. I, I'd listened very closely to the uh, Australian bush and uh, some of the, the um, shapes and patterns had come out of that but I, I'd had a, a complete sort of cleaning out of everything I knew beforehand. I, I, I got rid of the what I had decided was the boring old um, avant-garde from Europe. And I was trying to find something that related to us, to me, and uh, to Australia. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's, that's uh, at that point, I, I had really uh, gone to an extreme with the, these pieces. They, I, they did work in the concert hall, but I mm -hmm. sort of thought, well, I've got to, I can't keep doing this. So, the shapes, the patterns, uh, the the um, sort of general uh, intent of the music, I, I transferred to another style. And I think the first pieces I did with that was the uh, the infamous piano <laughs> piano concerto. I 
I, uh, I just want to do something completely different. If you're going in, in one direction, I find it, it's uh, sometimes you, you um, sort of want to run in the other direction because you just, uh, it, you've done it too much. Uh, but so I, uh, I did that. I admit I wanted to get up the nose of the boring people who, who were pushing yeah. European yeah. music as well. And I did that uh, very successfully. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, it's, and it's one of the, the most classic uh, lines in a review is that it's the kind of piece that gives A major a bad name. Yeah, it wasn't even A major, but still. Oh, no, <laughs> it didn't well, get a bad name. They got that wrong too. Yeah, exactly. But it's one of one of those lines that you dream of as a composer, you know, as a for a bad review. That one, that's a classic one. Yes, yes, that's one of my best, uh, or worst. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that was, uh, it, it reflected how I felt at the time. I was sick of listening to the uh, minute details of an environment and I wanted to embrace the whole thing, uh, all its colour and its, its vibrancy. And so uh, that's what I did. And um, so I, the pe people have gradually accepted it, um, even even uh, those sorts of people who write criticisms are, are less <laughs> angry about it now. Um, so I'm still going. Uh, but then that, having done that, um, I started to, to write uh, music that was suitable for the concert hall uh, and, um, and that retain the spirit of uh, what I'd been trying to do, which was to try to put people under, you know, to mesmerise them. I just, I was fascinated with what might happen. I'd been investigating all sorts of uh, chant uh, and uh, Sufi music, uh, uh, etc., uh, and uh, relating that to the insect chorus. And that's uh, really how I came to write um, incantations. The, the name came much later, actually. Um, mm -hmm. It was originally called Maninia Three, uh, but uh, incantations seemed to fit it because of the, the repetitive nature uh, of the music. And um, so that, uh, well, that's, that's what I did. All these little interlocking particles, these yeah. overlapping uh, phrases of insects, frogs and so on that uh, fascinated me at the time and uh, uh, gradually i was getting bird song into it i think yeah <laughs> yes that kind of the bird song sort of comes a little bit later doesn't it uh, but what i think just unpacking a few things here for our, our audience when we're we're listening to it then how does you mentioned the insect chorus mm. um I, I think we can uh, you get a general idea of the, the sort of bright colors and the vibrancy of the natural world from from the piece really easily. Can you tell us how the the influence of the of the insect world kind of manifests itself in the in the patterns in this music? Well, I mean, you can't actually hear the insects, but you can hear something like it. Drones became very important yeah. in my music, and so I I do think of cicadas and and uh, uh, in in these pieces and of course the, the style has gradually changed it's been overlaid with all sorts of other things but this was an early example of it uh, the piano concerto was more discursive in some ways i think in narrative uh marimba dances was just a little boppy piece that i put in a drawer and then suddenly it was it was being played all over the world yeah because it's so difficult. I think sadistic um, percussion teachers used to give it to their students for exams and so on. Uh, anyway, so those pieces were seminal in uh, insofar as the, the, the apparent change of my style is concerned. Um, I still regard that uh, it's related to the earlier pieces, like um, that clarinet piece, the Tara from Malcolm and so on, which were very still. Uh, and not going anywhere. Uh, these pieces are still not going anywhere. They're focused on the present. Mm -hmm. The wind quintet particularly, not so much the other two. Yeah, I think, um, I, I, I think for audiences it can be useful to have a listen to a piece like Prelude and Dragonfly Dance, which I think makes the, the inset chorus really quite, uh, quite vibrant. Um, and then listen again to incantations and then you can kind of hear how those those patterns sometimes it's the unpredictability of the patterns i think that that is the it's the thing that that relates uh, closely to uh, what you what you're saying is the, the insect patterns on the, and and it's insects are quite unpredictable i mean cicadas will suddenly change <laughs> yeah. anyway <laughs> 
Yes, yes, that's a good one, Predator and Dragonfly Dance. Yeah. Um, so really at, at this time in the, in the 1980s, there was this wave of uh, exploration of, of simpler harmonic patterns that, that you're using here and more vibrant rhythmic patterns that were, were kind of forbidden by the avant-garde world. Um, this is kind of a follow-up to the first question. Was there something about Australia in those days that uh, allowed composers this freedom compared to, say, if you were uh, stuck in, in Munich or, um, or or Vienna or something and, and felt the need to you know, follow the, the, the pattern that had been set up in the institutions? Do you, do you, is there something about Australia that, that gave you that, um, that freedom to explore? Yes, definitely. It, I felt that uh, I really didn't want to follow the, the European pattern because uh, I thought here's an opportunity to do something a bit different. And um, I, it wasn't that I thought I needed to, I just, it, it came from inside and I found myself doing it. Uh, so the, uh, yes, I, I, I became a heretic and uh, <laughs> gleefully and uh, I, I, um, I suppose uh, uh, the drones probably stuff. I found myself when, when when I was living up the coast, I'd walk around and I'd listen to insects, and I I was really uh, very uh, taken with cicadas because they were so mysterious, and um, and I really related them to drones in um, so much music that's close to the earth. Uh, which obviously the European avant-garde wasn't. It had got right away from it. And it, it brings us back to the environment and the importance of it in my music. Um, it, it taught me a lot um, from relating to world music and um, our insects. So... Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank you. That's, that's a wonderful explanation of, of, of that process. And I, I think, um, you know, as an observer, that I would say that you're amongst kind of this, this first new wave of of uh, exploring this kind of music and and sort of recreating, um, uh, re you know, sort of renewing music in in this area. And it's interesting that it's in new world countries such as the United States and Australia that have kind of forged forged in this direction first. Um, so, well, that's the west coast of the United States. The others are still. Being, oh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think of, there's. I think, think there's serialization and so. I, I, I think there's there's a lot of diversity still happening in the in the. US. Yes, it's it's expanding. Um, uh, one one of the things that uh, Alex Ross, uh, for example, observes is that that music is no longer sort of a train, with composers trying to get from the rear of the of the train to the front of the train. Um, music is now. Going, uh, you know, like um, like the Big Bang, you know, going in a million places at once. Um, yes, and, and so, and so yeah. it's because of the, the the opening up of of these ideas in the in perhaps in the late seventies and nineteen eighties that have, have allowed this great expansion of, of diversity. So I'm just sort of you know piecing this this piece within that framework of this opening up, which I think it is. Yes, and also I think the fact that music uh, stopped being narrative and focused on the present, that's, uh, to me, is something to do with um, the imperialistic urge having waned somewhat and people who questioned it and realised that, you know, what, we'd, what, what had happened. In all uh, 19th century, 18th, 19th century music, uh, you get this narrative that's actually goal directed and going somewhere yeah. and I yeah. uh, I wanted to get away from that I wanted to look at the minutiae of the things and um, uh, and, and observe them closely and uh, which is what I was supposed to do I wrote this sort of static music um, and just gradually I started to do other things with it uh, to overlay uh, all sorts of symbols and references from other cultures which related to the essential uh, thing that I've been working with which is bringing it out of the environment and into a concert hall. Yeah thank you that's that's a wonderful um, wonderful explanation of that that non-narrative aspect which I, I think we can explore explore that a little bit later. Um, I'm still kind of going in terms of uh, context historical context and societal context to an extent in, and this is a question about the 1980s, 
Um, and I hope you can remember them. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, was, I was still a school student at the time. Um, but this was a, a time of profound change in Australia. And looking back at that time, it was, in fact, an, a, an era of great artistic vibrancy and I guess a, a, a time of growth in Australia uh, for this artistic vibrancy. Um, although the Australian Council wasn't exactly plush with money, it did seem still possible to to start new things and to commission works. And, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I think in that context, the, the Australia Ensemble as well was beginning its its journey and touring mm-hmm. overseas and, and, mm-hmm. and so on. Um, so, so, yeah, these groups supported new music composition and that's bequeathed us a number of these important works such as, as incantations. Um, do you have any reflections on the Australian music ecosystem in those days, looking back? Um, how do you see it compared to now and uh, how important were those, those kind of seminal days for, for you as a composer? Yes, I remember that the, the Australia Council and actually sitting on the board and uh, <laughs> I remember that there was so much to be done and so little money, yeah. uh, which was depressing. At that point, in the early-ish 1980s, I'd left a secure lecturing position at the Sydney Conservatorium, uh, which might have, it was a huge risk, but I'm so glad I did it, because I just wasn't happy with what I was expected to teach, and I wanted to go in my own direction and do something that related to me, related to Australia. Um, And so, it, times were pretty precarious and I'd sit around hoping a commission would come because I'm no good at seeking these things out myself, being a, a total introvert. Um, but uh, they always did, fortunately. Sometimes I'd just, we'd get through. You know, by, and Helen was amazing, my wife Helen. She did all sorts of things like oh, she taught piano, she did health cookery. So in the lean periods before when I didn't get a commission, um, and there weren't many of them, but she, she was sort of very active. But we got through, and um, it was a period, of, a very exciting period, and people, there weren't so many, it seemed there weren't so many people wanting to be composers. Uh, they all jumped on the bandwagon later on, and uh, uh, which I always thought was rather silly of them, you know, knowing what was like, <laughs> what to expect. Uh, it was great, but you know, so we, it, it, there were uh, now there is there's such diversity, which is a good thing. Um, uh, 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 which people are, are sort of trying out all sorts of different things, and it's become a bit messy, a bit uh, exciting, a bit uh, I don't know, I can't completely relate to it, I think, because uh, the 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 idea of a profession of being a composer and being totally committed to doing something uh, has, is this relevant? Do you think I should, do you think this is a bit controversial? Yeah, no, no, keep going. Yeah. This is good. Yeah. Today, uh, I think the idea I, I, of being a composer, a professional composer, uh, is more or less untenable, I think. I've only just managed to, to get through it myself. But here we have, uh, very many people, because of the electronic media and so on, and um, uh, nobody writes with a pencil and paper anymore except me. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, everybody's having a go at it, and that's great. But how on earth do they live? Yeah. Um, that that's the question that, that that concerns me. I remember when I was a, uh, a student, I was in the same class as Martin Wesley Smith. Uh, and uh, also, at some point, Anne Boyd, and there wasn't any one else really. Um, but now I, I remember giving a, a, a talk at the con, and there are about sixty people. And I said, "Are you all composition students?" And they said, "Yes." And I said, "Well, I don't know what I said, but I don't know what I thought. Gee, this is crazy." <laughs> but still, anyway, it's it's lovely that everyone has been wanting to be creative and going in so many different directions. Yeah. We're not sort of doing as we're told. That's what really made me upset. You know, if you didn't do this, you got bad marks, uh, you, or you were just uh, sort of trivialised. <laughs> um, but no more. I mean, this, it's the pluralistic um, approach, I think, is well and truly 
Um, yeah. yeah. It's it's well and truly established, but you you rightly underline the the conundrum though of of although there's all this diversity and all these uh, mm -hmm. these people undertaking activities, the support or professional support of of this world has just completely you know it's, it's disappearing by the moment, and and this is a real challenge for us mm -hmm. in the uh, the artistic mm -hmm. world um, and for uh, for freelancers at the moment who are. Who have lost all their work, and you know, count them yes. members of the Australia Ensemble um, who are sitting at home at the moment instead of touring. Uh, these these mm. are really really challenging times. Mm. Um, but mm. let's let's move forward to the win the the, com, the idea of com, composing for a wind quintet. And you mentioned before that it's a they are a tricky beast. Um, and the Australia Ensemble wind players are often lamenting the kind of you know the the, the lack of really. Good quintets, so we're really uh, we really appreciate the fact that this one's a, a, a cracker. Um, they are technically tricky because of their they are a heterogeneous group of woodwinds with flute, oboe, clarinet, bassoon, and French horn. Mm -hmm. They all have different attacks, different ranges, different dynamic curves. They are all, all highly individualistic with their sonorities. Um, but I think you've solved this in a in a in a multitude of different ways. Can you maybe talk us through some of the traps that you see in writing for uh, for wins, and what sorts of problems? How did you solve some of these problems in this piece? Well, if I yes, I suppose I I managed to integrate them into a, a, a homogeneous texture uh, without making the colours stand out too much. Oh. Which, but of course, it's good that they do. I mean, if you can. Uh, uh, exploit these very different, as you say, attacks and, and different colours and different capabilities too in, in range. Uh, that can be that can make a very interesting piece. This one tends to subdue them a bit, and it's more a texture uh, that is un, well unchanging in terms of colour, or not not greatly exploiting colour, individual colours. There's quite there's lots of subtle shifts of, of colour. I find. Lots of, sort of things in inner voices that 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 uh, move around and are constantly changing. So yeah, yeah. I I did I wrote another uh, wind quintet recently, uh, which is called the Laughing Moon, which is also on that, that CD you That's, mentioned. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, quite different. It's 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 got a number of different short movements, and it's highly impractical because I've got the I often do things like that. I, I get the the um, horn player to play percussion as well, uh, which uh, he was not amused by. <laughs> recording, <laughs> we got a, a percussionist in to do that. But uh, it can. It, well, I, I like to give challenges, and but sometimes I go overboard. <laughs> <laughs> Could you talk us through the uh, structure of incantations, Ross? Uh, uh, and are there particular ways which the listener can experience this? music more meaningfully. Um, so I mentioned the idea of the inner voices and the movement movement of those. Um, I find actually it's a bit like listening to early European vocal music, early 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 music, where there's lots of lots of movement internally. Um, can you would maybe just talk us through a couple of those points. Yes, okay. But it, there were two uh, rather similar sorts of movements. And when I revised the piece, I think in 19, oh no, 2002, I think. Anyway, I added another one because I thought it, it, it needed an introduction uh, instead of hopping straight into this uh, uh, sort of mesmeric texture. I think that, that people it should, ideally, I mean, they can do what they like, but uh, I, I like the idea of focusing on something which is slowly changing yeah. um, and that's what I was set out to do with the piece. Uh, it's quite unlike what the minimalists were doing uh, which I felt that they were always going somewhere gradually but I was staying in the same place mm -hmm. and exploring its intricacies uh, at closely at close range and um, just to see if it changed you rather than the music than the music changing yeah. and uh, so uh, I, at that stage, I, I hadn't got into um, lighting. 
but later on, some of these pieces, I asked uh, the concert, uh, the concert hall to, to light them in different ways. Then I got into costume and I went really overboard. And now I'm trying to come back. Especially as I have to write solo pieces at the moment. Yeah, right. <laughs> yes, there'll be lots, lots of uh, demand for solo pieces at the moment. Mm. Um, so I, I really quite like the, the new movement that you've added. It, it, it sort of introduces each of the components and then each of the components are then sort of uh, locked together. Um, so it, it's quite nice mm. to hear the, the disparate voices before they then uh, sort of set off into this yes. kind of dance-like journey. So. Um, mm. So I, I, I very much liked the, uh, the the introduction of that new movement, and it tends to round out the structure as the whole really well in a nice mm. nice three movement form. Um, the the last movement I find particularly fascinating, and it starts off this it's slightly more melancholic flavour, um, and then it takes um, off yes. takes off in, in the middle in this kind of series of, of outbursts, and then um, and then the the, the tempo relationships are, are really cleverly mapped out. It's like a microcosm of the whole whole three movement journey sort of compacted in, into the last movement. Um, mm. So um, is, is, there, is, is there a particular, uh, particular thought behind the, the, the quick transitions in your music? Um, are they, I, I find it really interesting when you pull the rug out from under our feet. Um, mm. uh, but I'm just interested to hear your thoughts on, on how that works in, in that last movement in particular. I don't map out a structure ever. I think I keep, go keep going and I think, okay, um, <laughs> we need a change here. Right. It's literally like that. Yeah. And uh, then um, I, I try to make something that's effective. I, I, actually, that movement is my favourite as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one uh, really could put you in a rut if you uh, let it. Um, the the second, I thought with the, uh, when I, I the first fast movement, yeah. uh, it does something quite different. Oh. It, it it's it keeps you in one place. Whereas the the second movement is actually moving somewhere, and it ends up quite ecstatic. But as you say, it's melancholic as it begins with that sort of horn. Yeah, you can call it a melody, but it's. <laughs> Yes, and that that recalls then the textures of for the of the new first movement too, which I I think the new first movement kind of really successfully puts the puts the components in place and it sort of sets it up. So, yes, yes, uh, I wrote I wrote two first movements and then I lost the other one, but that one <laughs> <laughs> that one stuck anyway. And the, and the quintet who played it said, "Oh no, this is great. Um, we're happy with that." <laughs> <laughs> so I went with them. <laughs> that's, a, that's a little. That's a little musicological. Uh, that's an honours thesis for someone. Some. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, so you mentioned the the, the idea of um, staying in one place and exploring the, the here and now, uh, mm. the, the the momentary. Um, so it's pretty obvious in a piece with the title incantation that there's there's something going on there. Um, so an incantation can be something from the stock of fairy tales, uh, bewitched spells and charms, but I think you mean it in the sense of it can be part of a ritual or uh, something evoked by chant or prayer. Is that kind of where you're yes. going with that? Yeah. Yes, I, I think it certainly is. And you can, some of these, I, I, if you remember back to, now when did I write Eternity? Uh, that was another controversial piece. Yes, uh, it was back, or, in the, 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 back in the 70s for the- um, uh, 73, yeah. yeah. And that, that um, it just chanted a phrase over and over. And it was getting, it, it was accumulating energy. Uh, and in the end, it sort of uh, exploded. But um, it was interesting because it completely split the audience. I mean, half of them thought it was ridiculous and the others were, uh, went, did what I intended. They went right under, they were sort of mesmerized by it. And the, the choir was actually, uh, uh, was actually hyperventilating, I think, and they were very happy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they were happy that they survived the, the work. So, yes, yes it's got mm. to, to do this aspect of, of ritual, which I observed uh, in my thesis 26 years mm. ago. Now, 26, oh, gee. No. I know, it goes <laughs> too fast. Um, but I'm glad that that stuck around because it shows that I, I was on the right track there. Um, 
We, yes, it's been, it was, it's been done again and it's been recorded and they lost the recording. And But anyway, I mean, that's another story. It's it's amazing. It's, it's, it has stayed and it still has the potential to be uh, heard again. And, and when it was done again at the Canberra Festival some years ago, uh, people were uh, tended to be much more focused on it. I think they understood better what I was getting at. I mean, this is this is eternity, which was recorded. Mm. I remember actually sang in a recording of it, and that's that. Unfortunately, since has has been lost, hasn't it? I believe so, or they just ran out of money. Uh, uh, the, right. I just don't know. But yeah. uh, yeah. it's a it's a shame. It would be great to be able to uh, play a bit. To, uh, actually, no, it is. It, it does exist, as far as I know. It does uh, exist. No, but it, it, to putting it together and getting it out is another problem. Yes, yes, yes. As yes, we yes. know. Okay, as we know. Yeah. Well, that's that's another little follow-up project, I guess. Um, mm. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'm talking about the the, com, the, the more general idea of, of ritual in your music and um, the ideas that you are talking about meditation going under. Um, mm. And uh, I'm just interested in this, in these no, these quite Buddhist notations of meditation and so on. How uh, maybe I'll put it just quite directly. How how Buddhist do we need to be to appreciate this? Uh, gee, it's a, I don't know how to answer that really. Uh, you, you have. To, I think uh, today uh, society understands these things better, and because there's yeah. a million people. Um, doing meditation and so on mm. but this was my version of it was to try and relate it to australia uh, and therefore it it the core of it it comes from the australian environment but over the top of that i've overlaid all sorts of symbols to help you know like the uh, 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 the various goddesses that appear later on and um I know it sounds terribly eccentric, but in fact, it does relate to, to uh, various religious symbols which are universal uh, and which are trying, in my case, to take us to a better place, to a less diffused, a less sort of uh, crazy world, uh, which, of course, has to happen. And I think we're getting it at the moment, aren't we? <laughs> it's a, yes, it is. It's a very like scary that. way to do it, but, yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm. So, um, that's it. I would. I, I'm not a Buddhist on not anything really, but I, 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 I just I think in terms of these very essential uh, ideas and practices, uh, and try and um, bring them into the, the concert hall, into our consciousness, into our music, and and uh, the way we think, and calm us down as a good way. <laughs> to yeah, to yeah. at the moment, I'm I'm writing a uh, something which accompanies the most horrific images of, of the Vietnam War, and it's about peace. And um, gradually, it's a chant, again, with, of course, an orchestra, uh, um, which I think is, is subsidised by or, or commissioned by the Department of Veterans Affairs. And um, it's, it's uh, somehow, uh, instead of me re reacting to these awful uh, images, including the little girl on fire, if you remember that uh, dreadful thing. Um, it's, uh, I'm, I'm making it a sort of a lullaby uh, that just wraps it all up and, and says, no, we're going to make it better. Uh, but can ex I don't know if that makes sense, but by the end, it's quite sort of, it's a very ecstatic. But it just starts with a, a slow drum beat, and so the drone is ever present in my uh, music, and um, it gradually accumulates energy, good energy. Yes, that's right. I mean, it's the it, it's it's the classic thing of the artist having to having to make sense of the of the world in turmoil. The world, yes, I mm. feel, feel like it's it's a process of of healing that. Yeah, that but I don't think it's our function really. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Yes, I mean that's something that, that we've talked about before. Is the idea of of music having some sort of function, mm. um, it out of the concert hall, and you know, with these very strange circumstances, that that is happening in a very real sense these days, um, and that yes. music is in some ways, you know, more important than ever. Um, so, um, how should we best take advantage of of music in these strange times? I think we have to be more practical. Um, I'm, I'm uh, looking for, uh, I'm looking to write 
uh, solo pieces, which can either be performed uh, by uh, one person or recorded and put on the, the um, uh, internet. Uh, uh, and of course, used in all sorts of other ways. I'd like dances and and uh, in, in costume and so on. But later, uh, so I'm I'm sort of storing up uh, music which could, will be useful during this period and also afterwards. Um, but I haven't really got into that yet. I'm I'm okay. I'm just talking to various people about it. Yes, and I, look, I think that's that's a classic thing where the artist reacts to the circumstances and finds. Find solutions. Yes, if if you go back to the First World War and Stravinsky, I mean, he had to scale right down, uh, and you, you, so you've got the Soldier's Tale and all these sorts of pieces, that, which otherwise wouldn't have been uh, written had it not been a time of great probation. And, uh, yeah. Yes. No. That's that. That's yeah. a good insight. Um, so for our for our listeners, I think it's a chance for for them to go and have a listen to the the pieces that were going to be on our our program. Um, and and you're, they can have a, a listen to that whole incantation CD. So that's a that's an excellent chance to kind of explore explore the oeuvre of a of a single composer like this. Mm. So um, to our to our audience watching this, um, we're very sorry that you're not able to be listening to the Australia Ensemble performances of this piece. Um, but I hope you've enjoyed this interview, and thank you, Ross, for taking part in it and sparing the time for it. And it's good to good to know what you're up to at the moment. Um, oh, that's a great pleasure. Thank you. Cool. Thanks yeah. for thinking of it. It's a, good, a terrific idea. Actually. And thanks, for, uh, uh, thanks to Helen as well for uh, <laughs> setting you up in. Her advice in that <laughs> <laughs> we've, got a, we've got an insight into, uh, in, into um, our, our home lives now. Um, so we'll have more of these composer conversations online um, in the future and... Um, Thanks for tuning in, everybody, and we'll see you again soon. Bye. <laughs>